All right, everyone, welcome to the STOA. Today's session is called Menstrual Trauma, the Healing of Our Culture with Adriana Forte and Jane Collins. And I'm going to take in Adriana in a moment, and she's going to uh, lead today's session. And Adriana is a mother, developmental coach, and facilitator, and woman's mysteries teacher. And um, she's going to set the frame of the, today's session, introduce Jane, and then they're going to have a dialogue, and uh, then we're going to engage in Q&A. So if you have questions anytime, put them in the chat. And then we get to the Q&A portion. Uh, I'll call and you can ask your question. And then uh, we may have a, a breakout room uh, before we close. And we're here for 90 minutes in total. Uh, so that being said, I'm going to take in uh, Adriana to set the, the frame for today's session. Welcome back to the STOA. Thank you, Peter. Um, yes, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm just stoked to see um, familiar faces and a few people I don't know but um yeah I noticed my heart getting really moved as I was looking at the the faces in the screen and the time spent with probably most of you here so um yeah thanks for for taking the time um so um there's yeah there's emotion arising for me because this topic um is super important in my world it's actually um this is the birth of me uniting my work. I haven't, I haven't actually united my work before, which is uh, I kept the developmental part of my work and the facilitation and the coaching over here. And I kept the women's mysteries work over here and um, it wasn't working very well. So this is, this is the beginning of actually bringing it um, here. And just now, as I was, uh, I was talking to Jane and Peter, just in the in the room, I recognized the little a little um, rubber band for you to see how long it's it's been that I've been on this quest on this journey of why is it why is it that that the menstrual cycle is still not a thing? And I mean, it pervades every you know it pervades everything, not just women's bodies, but. And uh, about six years ago, I was involved in a project and I made these wristbands that mostly just my friends bought. Uh, it's called um, Every Girl Deserves a Good Cycle. And that's really the spirit of, of that. It's um, I have two girls and I don't wanna, I don't want them to leave. I don't want to leave the world before. That's just a lived experience of beauty in, in women and men and you know um, the collective at large. So. Um, I'm stoked to be in a space with, with people like yourselves that I admire and I learn from and with, and with Peter, which to me, it's a beautiful combination because I have Peter on my left on my screen and Jane on my right, and Peter to me symbolizes in my psyche the uh, uh, healthy, beautiful, masculine energy of discernment, clarity, and you know, doing and precision. And I love that and so important. And Jane is here to my right, fiercely bringing the feminine for years and years and years in a time when that was much harder to do and speak of than today. Um, so to start us off, I'm just going to um, share my screen and do a short um, presentation. It might take us five minutes or so. And then I'll introduce Jane and then we'll start the conversation. Maybe I'd love you to, if you could put on the chat why you are here, that would be beautiful as well. So I could start the, just touching base with you and, and seeing if this question is something that has been a question for you ever, or if it's just, you know, some of you are my friends or some of you, you know, just want to be here because of Peter or the soul, or whatever. So that, that's, that'll be nice to know. With that, I'll share my screen. All right. So menstrual trauma, the healing of our culture. But what does that even mean? So in the context of this conversation, I'm using the word trauma um, as Gabo Mate uses. Trauma is not only what shouldn't have happened to you, but did. It is also what should have happened, but didn't. And also trauma that happens in the collective needs to be healed by the collective. Numbness and disconnection is a sign of trauma. I also want to bring in the notion of um, intergenerational trauma here that both Gabo Mate and Thomas Hubel use. And 
it's the same trauma that maybe a war um, uh, uh, war soldier might have felt, but he, uh, he has felt that, but the, the three or four generations after, this will still be felt by uh, people in his lineage. But now I'm talking about this, but in the collective, in the wombs of every person that has a womb. Um, because my mother had it, my grandmother had it, my great-grandmother had it. In the women's mysteries language, we talk about that as the trauma of the red thread. Um, so when a young woman gets their period, instead of pride, many of them, I'd say most of them, would feel shame or disregard. Many will just will do what culture tells them to. They'll plug their tampon and carry on regardless. Otherwise, they're not cool. And of course, they want to fit in at that time, so they carry on. And many will grow up trying to blend in, and some will even succeed. But some will never feel like they had their voices heard. And even if some have mastered the art of living in this world with recognition, money, status, and power, they might still feel like they were never truly seen, which is probably true. They will live their lives unaware of their cyclical nature and therefore will be had by it and unable to harness its intelligence and power. Can you imagine a circle trying to live as if it was a line? Well, basically, that's what we have been doing um, for generations in some way. Most women will ignore or dislike their cycles their entire lives, completely oblivious to what they're missing out on because no one, one, and el no one else seems to notice it either. This is about 50% of the world's population. Women have the four seasons within them, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, every month over and over again for about 40 years of their lives. Modernity or the machine or patriarchy loves spring and summer, which funnily enough is the masculine phase of the cycle, which is the phase that we're more compliant and um, appealing to culture and in our doing mode. But our culture doesn't like autumn and winter very much. The machine or patriarchy has even given a name to this phase of the monthly cycle, PMS. In a woman's life cycle, this phase has also a name, menopause. And guess what? Modernity also doesn't like that phase very much. So many of us will carry on trying to fit in, but by now it's starting to get a little bit harder and most of us will die without ever knowing what living from our cyclical nature could mean. So to finalize, I just wanna put here this thought provocation that I would love us to, to be in relationship with um, openly with curiosity. If we won't gain the metamodernity or the most beautiful world our hearts know is possible to become reality, I'd say that we need to heal our relationship to the menstrual cycle. But for that to happen, we need to first learn that our current collective and individual relationship to the cycle is probably not good. We need to be open and curious about the menstrual cycle and what being cyclical means. That will help us grow up, mature our relationship to the cycle and deepen our awareness on what that means and how it shows up for us individually and collectively. And after that, we'll notice the way that a woman through her cycles sees, feels, creates, and interacts with the world is fluid and much less linear than the current systems would like us to think. So with that, we can help change the systems and not the women, the women and start appreciating circles and lines in all their variations both in their beauty and strength, dancing together to create systems in which all of us can thrive. And this is the little artistic <laughs> um, circles and lines dancing together. I'll stop my share and we'll start this conversation.
Um, so Jane, um, well, Jane is the woman that introduced me to a big part of what I've shared um, just now. And it was about 12 years ago that I met her and I was pregnant with my first daughter. And I went to study with her more deeply. I did a year long journey with her. And then I trained again to initiate girls into their menstrual cycles. And then I went to study with other teachers and to teach fathers and, um, and bring this in a, in a different way into the world. And then I went, um, so Jane is, she's a mother and a grandmother and she is um, not only a women's mysteries teacher, she's the, she's, she founded a school, now the School of Shamanic Womancraft that brings this work into the world. And, um, but she started as a midwife and part of what she's gonna lead us into is how she went from being a midwife to working with a menstrual cycle and the link that we um, hope to convey in this in today's session between this um, trajectory. So Jane, um, if you can introduce yourself more fully and then you can segue into um, your work now, that would be beautiful. Thank you, Adriana. Hello, everybody. And it was great to just read the comments in the chat, uh, chat bar of why everybody's come. And, you know, I think if you all have a little look there, you'll see what what um, is kind of a little bit of a litmus test or a status report of where people are at with the cycles and particularly the menstrual cycle. And, you know, like they don't call it the women's mysteries for nothing. Clearly, it remains a, a mystery to most people. And so how I got to be in this situation of this being my life work is that I became a midwife when I was 25 and I was introduced to what I now know was what you're calling game A, the patriarchy through my experience of training to be a midwife in a big city hospital in Sydney, Australia, where I had an awakening to basically how the culture was treating women. And as a student midwife, where I was one of the reinforcers of the modality of obstetrics, basically, and working for obstetricians and learning how to be a midwife and how to be with birth, what I saw was institutionalized acts of abuse and violence being carried out on women and babies masquerading as safety. And I saw misogyny at its worst and disregard and disrespect for women's individual processes and lives and what brought them to that situation and all of that. So it was, what I saw was institutionalized birth, which is the system the maternity care system and it doesn't really serve anybody and how it works now is it creates and this is before the pandemic it will have increased since the pandemic one in three women experience birth trauma in our modern maternity care system and that's a tragedy because starting motherhood with birth trauma is not okay and I was a midwife for 30 years and in my practice, I began to see the obvious and that is that it's a little bit too late to help women change their mindsets when they're having a baby. And that often what happens when they're there in, in, the, in the midst of giving birth is that they, they sort of go back to their default behaviors and beliefs and fears. And what I learned was that these actually are or were and are a reflection of their perspective of their body. And surprise, surprise, there's a connection to one's ex experience and perspective of one's body and therefore how it works or not. And everybody gives birth in the way that one could read as a culmination of their life thus far, or a readout of their mindset, their beliefs and attitudes and fears. And so in that way, our births become our teachers because 
it shows us how we give birth shows us our mindset and therefore how that created our experience and there are less than i think it's about 42 percent of women in australia last year had a normal vaginal birth so it's below 50 percent so this is actually a very serious problem and it's well known but what i learned was the connection as i said to everything else so it's the menstrual cycle that is the pre prequel to giving birth and in fact it's a girl's menarche or her first period her rite of passage into womanhood that creates the woman complete with the um, perspective she learns from her rite of passage into womanhood it's that experience which is not usually very good and is often full of shame that sets up how we expect how we know our culture values woman and therefore how do we have to behave to be accepted by our culture and then this girl turns into a young woman and is encouraged to reject her menstrual cycle like everybody else does and then this leads to her rejecting her body and if you reject your menstrual cycle which is actually your inner compass then you get lost and as adriana said menstrual shame is actually the thing that girls and women and everybody are experiencing so this all plays out in the birth because one rite of passage leads to the next and she who was initiated into womanhood at menarch is the woman who shows up to give birth completely enculturated in how she's supposed to behave as a woman to be accepted by the culture and i hope many of you women there are just having a little think about your menarch, your first period and what happened and what that taught you about probably that you had to hide your menstrual cycle, that you needed to carry on regardless and not show it as a weakness and carry on and as if nothing was happening, business as usual. And we know what happens when we ignore things, particularly in our body, they do whatever they have to do to get our attention. And menstrual pathology is through the roof you know it's that includes infertility and endometriosis and polycystic ovary syndrome as well as pain and irregularity and and all of that so the menstrual cycle is to quote alexandra pope who is a menstrual educator in the uk she has a school there that teaches women and other people online all about the menstrual cycle she says the menstrual cycle is the barometer of our well-being so that is a really key piece for women to understand and that is that the menstrual cycle is like the canary in the coal mine it's the place where for a woman or a woman a person who has a menstrual cycle it's the place where all that needs to show up about irregularity and toxicity and imbalance will show up and then collectively as i said menstrual pathology is like terrible and i'm sure that many of you either experience that or have or know plenty of women and girls and others who do so as a midwife i realized that in order to help women have more empowering and not even empowering safe and healthy birth they need to be connected to their body first and that happens through connection to the menstrual cycle and that happens through and empowering and not even empowering in a way that you're trying to give someone power, but an educational and informing menarch or first period so that they know what's going on, you know, that they understand the cycle. And when we understand the cycle, the menstrual cycle, we realize the interconnectedness we have with all of the earth and all of everything because it's cyclical as well. And as Adriana said, you know, this culture that we live in is not really one that goes along with cycles and therefore <clears throat> leaves out the rest and rejuvenation phases, which include the harvest and the decay and the death and rebirth. And to our peril, we can see in our culture what's happened from an ignoring of the cycle. We have just taken and taken from the earth and we have burned everybody out and every resource out. And because we haven't taken consideration of the entire cycle we just live in a growth economy that just goes 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 24 7 availability on 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 
with no rest and look at the mess we're in. And what I love so much is that the clues for what we need to do, which is to live an earth honoring and sustainable lifestyle. What I love so much is they are hiding in plain view in how one needs to be with the menstrual cycle. So isn't that so classic that the menstrual taboo, the menstrual shame that pervades everyone all over the world holds the clues for how we need to live a better life in regard for the cycles and the earth and each other. So that's a bit of a long answer to how I got into this work. But when I got into this work, what I saw was just so much menstrual trauma, so much menstrual shame. And the, the last thing I'll just say is that menstrual shame is part of our culture. You can't not have menstrual shame. In fact, Sharon Maloney, who's done a PhD on this subject, says that menstrual shame is one of the organizing principles of the patriarchy to maintain the oppression of women. Just have a think about that. And the thing is that menstrual shame, we know, we know from all the studies that have been done, menstrual shame leads to body shame and body shame leads to low self-esteem and low self-esteem leads to all manner of wounded behaviors, including self-harm, eating disorders and dangerous and risky sexual decision making. And when we are encouraged to reject our menstrual cycle, we lose our compass, as I said, but we, if we reject our menstrual cycle, we reject our body because it's, it's what our body does for 40 years of our life. If we reject our body, we reject ourselves. We reject ourselves and we're lost. And that's really where the status of the earth is now and the people on it and everything is a disregard for the feminine way, the cyclical way, which you can't avoid. And that's part of this conversation about remembering all this. Um, I, I love hearing you. I've heard you talk about that so, so much and I love hearing it again because um, I think it was the, you know, like for me, it was in hearing that the first time about 12 years ago and having goosebumps and going like, yes, you know, I come from Brazil, a, a culture in which all these elements that Jane speaks of are very, very um, accentuated. Um, the 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 beauty or the, the permanent youth, you know, the cycle that stops in spring in a woman's life, spring and summer, you know, there's nothing after. And um, I even have a little funny story to tell about, I just came back from Brazil just now, uh, a week ago, and, you know, I'm graying my hair and I have my wrinkles and in Brazil, it kind of like, I don't see that. I, it's just really, I, I don't see that in my age group. Uh, work has been done and and it was I, ha I was having lunch with my aunt about 25 years 20 years older than me and my mom and they all you know especially my aunt obviously has less wrinkles than me and no, no graying hair and it's not a judgment on how people they, I was just when she looked at me she touched my hair and she's like oh my god you're becoming a little old lady and I couldn't stop laughing of the caricature and truth and pain that was that because like it is true I was older I I was noticing that I was actually in in graying my hair and not doing something to my skin I was making a stand even though I didn't it, it wasn't my intention it was just it was just perceptible it was noticeable so I can really I can really see it's very evident how hard it is to go against the grain and the grain is just being natural just you know just doing what I'm doing because aging it is I am aging that's a truth and I'm not um but the the resistance is in me so that's something that I've been um recognizing lately and and coming into deeper awareness of the machine or the patriarchy or the game a in myself so where I perpetuate that every month you know like when when um so every time i hear a friend talking about baby brain you know apologizing saying oh it's just my baby brain i go like that's where we're perpetuating it that's just you know or when i've done it i've done it just there like i can't behave in the same way that culture wants me to therefore i'm gonna apologize i just made a baby and my intelligence is just so vast and i'm just holding all these things and learning all these things, but hold on, I'm gonna apologize because you know I don't fit into this criteria here in which I'm measured by. So there is, um, there is 
grief. There is a, when um, Jane and I are bringing this here, um, I don't want to just make it light. It's it's a big a big reason why I feel it's not integrated. You know, I've done a lot of after I studied with Jane, I went to do. Um, documentary that I never finished about it. I went to speak to a lot of people. I went to, I um, taught workshops to people that came to me, but I went to teach workshops to people that didn't come to me, that they were my favorites. So to agents of change. And these were the hardest because I could see, I could see that in spaces where women or maybe fathers that wanted to initiate their girls or moms that wanted to initiate their girls, there was an openness to that. In spaces where people were, um, you know, maybe writers of magazines or, or people in advertising agencies that I went to seek and, and just promote these notions because I saw how it was important to, um, for the rite of passage to happen, as Jane was talking about, you know, the girl is initiated and she she's initiated into something, even if, if um, if the mothers, like I'm trying to do with my girls, initiate them into beauty, if the world doesn't receive them as such and expect them to be this beauty and treat them with the reverence of that beauty, then this initiation is not complete. So what I saw in these workshops is that um, it was just, um, there was a lot of resistance to the topic from all sides. And I started um, this deep, this deep research on why that is. So one of the notions that we're exploring today is through the notion of trauma and the, the red thread. So this, you know, the, this felt experience of our great grandmothers and our grandmothers and our mothers and that we can change as we bring awareness to it that we're doing now, we're bringing awareness to it. So if we bring awareness, we go, wow, maybe some of us were like, wow, I never thought of this before. And this is changing already is doing a little dent in in the red thread um, in the in the in the in this mistaken idea that modernity um through which modernity sees sees the menstrual cycle and the the last piece i wanted to bring and then jane i wanted to to um talk more about it is that in this rite of passage in the sequence of rite of passages that jane was talking about we have the menach the first blood then we have birth but then we have menopause in which is the one that um, I just spoke about. So menopause is also the woman that has been initiated in Menach and has birth. If she hasn't come into a different relationship to her cycle up to menopause, that's gonna hit her hard. And that's what we see happening in culture a lot. And again, in culture, we see um, medicalized ways of dealing with that, with numbing ourselves but not actually, there is a lot of rage. I see a lot of grief and a lot of rage helped and supported by the hormones, but it's, it's something that's of a whole lifetime of, well, I haven't even been expressed this cycle. So um, yeah, I, um, maybe Jane, do you wanna speak yeah. to that a little bit? Well, I think maybe, what would be really good is just to step back a bit and understand what a rite of passage is. So everybody has rites of passage and they're cultural ones and there's physical ones. And they're all cultural because what a rite of passage actually does is create culture and reinforce it. And so cultural rites of passage would be things like marriage, graduation, first car, you know, all those sort of really important things that step you into the next place. And then the physical rites of passage uh, for women and female bodies, birth, everybody's rite of passage of birth is significant. And um, so puberty for boys. So boys and men go through these rites of passage as well. So puberty for boys and the menarch for girls, which includes puberty, but puberty for boys takes a lot longer. You know, it's, it's a long process with girls. They see their blood on their undies and that's the moment. So then the next physical rite of passage, as Adriana said, is childbirth, which is actually pregnancy because every pregnancy results in a, in a birth, whatever ends the pregnancy is a birth. And that's a rite of passage into motherhood. 
and then menopause, which is the cessation of fertility and the menstrual cycle, which basically goes for about 40 years, and then into the second half of a woman's life with the average age of menopause being around 50. So rites of passage do many things besides create and reinforce culture. So what happens at a rite of passage, so whatever's said or not said, whatever's done or not done, whoever's there, whatever's going on in the environment around them, teaches the person going through the rite of passage, we might call them the initiate, whatever's going on, teaches that person how their culture values the next role they're going into. So at puberty for a boy, it's manhood. At menarche for a girl, it's womanhood. At birth or the end of a pregnancy, it's motherhood. For a father, it's fatherhood. At menopause, it's wise woman or older woman. And midlife for a man, it's the older man. And so we learn from what goes on and how that experience is held or not held, which is mostly what happens, how the culture values that next role we're going into, and therefore how we have to behave to be accepted by the culture. So this rites of passage create culture on the inside by the mindset, the beliefs, attitudes and fears that the experience creates and on the outside by everybody conforming to that. And so all this wonderful thinking that we do about wanting to change from game A to game B will never happen unless we address these rites of passage because it's at these rites of passage where the games are created and reinforced. And I promise you there are very few girls having empowering experiences at their menarche, maybe more now because their mothers are realizing how much their experience mess them up and they want to give their daughters a better thing. And boys, you know, boys rites of passage into manhood have uh, uh, something that's being addressed by many men's groups, but boys create their own rite of passage if they're not honored and, and welcome to manhood by doing some sort of risky behavior to prove to themselves that they can whatever. So I would really encourage everybody here to be thinking about their puberty and what happened and what message that gave them about being a man for for the men here and about being a woman for, for the women here because it sets up a pattern that plays out your whole life until you realize it and upgrade your operating system, which is what's running from that. So rites of passage create and reinforce culture, but what they other, the other thing they do is provide us the opportunity to hack the culture. So we can change the culture by changing how individuals move from one part of their life or season of their life or stage of their life to the next. And there's a wonderful writer about this stuff, Bill Plotkin, an American man who actually focuses on the concept of rites of passage and recreating rites of passage for adults by encouraging people to do vision quests, which basically to take themselves into nature and have alone time where they basically slow down enough so that they can hear what they're telling themselves and realize how um, useless that a lot of that is and, and can commune with nature and the earth and realize what it means to be a connected human being on the planet. So there are so many ways to heal and reclaim our rites of passage and that's what we need to do for those who've already experienced them. <clears throat> but we can create the future <clears throat> by changing the way our rites of passage happen now. And as Adriana um, recalled from her visit to Brazil just recently, you know, menopause is probably, I, I'm not sure whether it's more feared than childbirth, but probably, but it's the, definitely the least spoken about phase or rite of passage in a woman's life and it's kind of made a joke of and a bit of a test of whether a woman lets herself go or not or whether she stays connected to the culture and how she's supposed to behave and look to be accepted and you know it's getting a little bit more airtime these days because the boomers are going through menopause and they've always got a lot to say about things so menopause is on the agenda but so much of the attitude around it is 
how to battle through the terrible experience where actually menopause is a rite of passage into our eldership and we all know how badly the world needs elders and how they've been missing and just one thing i want to say about menopause that i love so <clears throat> evolutionary biologists ask the question why would human women live beyond their fertile years what is the use of them which is a bit of a tragic question and a bit of a um, readout of our culture but they went to nature as evolutionary biologists do to have a look at the other animals to see what's going on there because that's the key thing i think that we need to remember is that we're animals we're not something super special we're animals and we, and we are a particular kind of animal called a mammal. And that's because we suckle our young. So what's these evolutionary um, biologists discovered what was that there are five creatures on the planet who go through menopause, only five creatures. So human women and the other four are the toothed whales, the pilot whales, the orcas, the beluga whales, and the narwhals, the unicorns of the sea. And so they investigated these post-menopausal grandmother, post-reproductive whales to see why, they, why, why would they bother to live. And what they discovered, which is just such fantastic and timely information, is that these post-reproductive grandmother toothed whales were actually the leaders of the pods. They were the bosses and their survive their their them being there and them being there in leadership ensured that their sons and their daughters lived longer and that their grandchildren survived because these whales knew how everything worked they knew where the food was with all the different currents and the different weather and all of that so what a reframe that menopause is actually creating the leaders for our community and you know, I'm sure many of you could imagine that, yes, that would be a good idea to have postmenopausal women as leaders because they are the wise women. But menopause in our culture doesn't create wise women. It creates women trying to look young. Not everybody, of course, but, but mostly. And another reframe on menopause is what traditional Chinese medicine calls it, and that is the second spring. So... There's another beautiful reframe for something that is seen as a failure against time or the unavoidable aging process, et cetera, et cetera, where actually it's the menopause is the birth of the wise woman that the earth needs now. So I'm just, um, should we have a look at some of these questions as we're going, Adriana, yeah. or do you want no, to talk more? No, that's great. I think, I think Peter is um, doing that. I was just going to, um... I was just going to, to share from my personal experience that, you know, I'm in my mid forties and I'm for sure feeling the, um, the beginnings or the middle of this journey, which is a long journey. And a lot of women think that menopause is only when you stop bleeding, but it's, you know, it's a trajectory that can last around 10 years. And I'm for sure feeling the changes in my hormones. And at some points I go like, oh my goodness, this confidence, there's a linear confidence <laughs> coming through which is hilarious to me because I've been taught by patriarchy or by you know, the machine that confidence looks a certain way and feels a certain way. And that's a lot of the reasons why a lot of uh, the women I meet in spaces like this or rebel wisdom or spaces that I have been navigating don't feel confident, but actually their confidence is cyclical. It's, there is a wavering and a fluid way to relate to the world, but the reflection back is that it's unsure or confused or, and I was just like, I'm tasting the, the linearity and I go like, oh, that's hilarious. Is that how men go? Like, is that, so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting move that's happening from this to, to just starting to do this. And I can see how um, with the wisdom collected of the cycles, but then the, 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 the fierceness, or like you said to me, Jane, just uh, yesterday when we spoke, the estrogen is the accommodating hormone. So when that wanes, you go, okay, that's time now. So that's interesting because it's, it's um, I'm noticing it. So I'm like actually excited about, about um, what menopause might bring. 
And so I wanted to, we've talked quite a bit and I wanted to just check in with people. Um, before we move into the questions, I was just interested to hear any comments or any sensations or any emotions or anything that's arising for anybody. We were gonna do breakout rooms, but I think maybe we could share here with, um, with everybody, if you feel called to share what's happening for you and we can have a couple or a few shares and then we can move into the questions. Monica has her hand up. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you, Jane, for this. This is amazing. I'm so excited. Um, I feel really um, excited and um, and beating up like seeing so many men here and, and um, feeling the curiosity about cycles. I already went through my last cycle, menopause. I never even noticed it. I've been practicing a lot of um, Chinese um, traditional medicine. So I got prepared years before about not making a big deal about it. So, but uh, nevertheless, I was so curious about this and I wanted to see how we can talk about it in a way that is not um, horrible or something that shouldn't be talked about or is dirty or whatever the things that we're so much told about. So I'm excited, I'm excited and I'm so happy to be here. So that's what I'm feeling right now. Thank you so much for making space for this. Wonderful, Monica. I'm really glad to hear that you had a graceful experience through your menopause. It's pretty uncommon. So the so that would imply, as you well, you said, you did a lot of preparation for it. And that's the thing that we need to get. That's the information we need to get to women that you need to prepare for menopause because the body you arrive at menopause with is the body that's going to take you into old age. And so we actually need to train for menopause. We need to be strong. We need to exercise. We need to eat properly. We need to stop the ignoring and sleep exactly and have different sleep cycles probably and use the experience for uh, what it is. And many women have talked a lot about it. And some of the things are that it's the rite of passage designed to heal all the unhealed parts of us that it's the mother of all wake up calls. It's the time when everything that's been swept under the carpet comes out. So that can actually be a cause of strife in many relationships when the hormone of accommodation, which is like a veil that descends upon us when we get our first period. And as Adriana said, the hormone of accommodation, like that's a good thing because it helps uh, the the mothers um, look after their babies and someone's got to do that, right? And so the hormone of accommodation has us want to do that. And it's kind of like sacrifice ourselves for the things and the babies and the people and the projects and whatever it is that we need to care for. But then at menopause, this veil of estrogen begins to rise and the hormone of accommodation goes away. And then relatively speaking, testosterone which doesn't necessarily rise but relative to the hormone of estrogen is higher and that's the beginning of what adriana was talking about of of the more yang experience and and yeah so part of reclaiming menopause is actually has to go back to the menstrual cycle as well because you know you need to know what you're what you're working with to be able to let go of it as well Thanks, Monica. Um, Rebecca and Vicky have uh, two shares, and perhaps we can pivot to the Q&A in the chats after that. Uh, what I noticed coming up for me, um, especially during Jane's share at the beginning, was like um, an excitement that of like, um, like a resonance with my inner knowing that my cycles are a really impart, a important part of my being and of how I can interact with the world. And also with that, like a feeling of helplessness because like I've, un, I've had that understanding for a while and find, found it really challenging to actually um, like embody the understanding when it comes down to time for my period and it's uncomfortable and 
I like after many years of having a period, I still find it really hard to not get stains on my clothing and to be able to do things I want to do. And um, it brings stress. And so I really want to find a way to feel like, oh, I'm embracing this as like a really important part of who I am and how I interact with the world. And it's like, it's hard. So just feeling that too. Can I just um, honor you there, Rebecca, because um, it's really, it is really hard. And that's, and that's what we're inviting in. It's really hard because as you said, um, and in conversations I've had, I hear that a lot, you are going against culture. So it's not that you are um, just going with your cycle. And I've had people uh, saying to me in workshops, well, now that I understand it, what do I do with it? Because my work doesn't understand it. My husband doesn't understand it. Life doesn't understand it. How do I live? You know, the edu education system or the financial system or the political system doesn't reflect that. Ac academia doesn't reflect it. So um, how do I be? How do I be and be received as what, I'm, what I am if the world doesn't see that? So that is the pain. And, and I think that this is one of the reasons why I'm bringing this conversation here. Because if the conversation is just had in the fringes, just by women, then it's going to take a long time until the systems see that we need to create systems with the knowledge embedded in them by women that live from and with the cycle. So then in generations to come, that's going to be a different dance and the systems will hopefully reflect you know, that. And then the pain will be different. Then I don't think I actually would guess that it wouldn't be a pain because if you're if you're bleeding in your undies and there's no shame, then that's that's what's happening. And you know, if um, if you're tired and you need to sleep, then that's what's happening. Um, yeah, thank you for that sharing. And Vicky. can I add something to that? Oh, yeah. Before, yeah, I just wanted to say, Rebecca, like, good on you, and thank you for bringing that here. And that in order to live by our cycle, our menstrual cycle, and live cyclically, it's a it's a total reframe. It's a paradigm shift. And it's in the ignoring of it, which is what we've encouraged to do, that the menstrual cycle bucks up, you know, and, and does whatever it can do to get our attention so that we pay attention to it because our menstrual cycle is running our life, whether we want it to or whether we realize it or not. And it's running the life of everybody who lives under the same roof as you as well and if you don't believe that just ask them so it is it behooves us to pay attention to it and it's it has we have superpowers around the cycle where it's better to do certain things at certain times in the same way that it is in the earth's seasons and our menstrual cycle through what we experience the symptoms are like a, a feedback thing we get biofeedback loops come from the menstrual cycle our experience in the third week of our menstrual cycle is like a feedback from how we did or didn't look after ourselves and our needs at the bleeding phase of the cycle. Everything that's not working in your life shows up in the third week of your menstrual cycle because that's the time that's the equivalent of the harvest phase and that's the time when women tell the truth and don't just keep putting up with things. But that's been pathologized and turned into PMS. So, because women don't conform, so there must be something wrong with them. Okay. Um, okay, I notice I feel really nervous. <laughs> um, okay, so I just want to speak to, um, yeah, this sort of tr menopausal transition because I'm also currently experiencing that or going through that in my life. And, um, I just want to share my experience. Um, I think I uh, have been coming into a healthy relationship with my body over the past 20 years and also have spent a lot of time extrapolating myself from the structures of society. So I've kind of got to my, myself in this place um, of having a good relationship with myself and my cycle and just uh, what's actually changing within my experience. And actually something that Adriana uh, spoke to, which I'm sort of recognizing I'm noticing in myself is this sort of linearity that's kind of coming online. 
And what I'm noticing is that there's actually sort of like this oscillation because I'm in that transitional phase of like sort of being swept off of that and then back onto it again. It's like almost experiencing a completely or, or coming into a completely different orientation to lit to life and how I live my life. So, you know, I have glimpses of like being really sort of clear and focused and, and I know which exactly which direction to go in. And then of course I'm still in that cyclical, at the end of that cyclical phase. So I'm, I kind of get pulled out of that slightly and then again, back into it again. So I'm noticing that oscillation at this perimenopausal stage. Um, yeah, that it's sort of like almost is that initiatory phase of going sort of having a taste of something and coming out of it and I imagine that then it eventually it will just click into place and I'm excited about that actually like it, it brings you know I'm, I'm thrilled that, that that's coming <laughs> yeah thank you that's wonderful Vicky good on you and tell everybody you know that because that's, that's the reframe that we need, you know, excited about this. So one of the previous experiences that we may have had is, if it was positive, before we did get our period and we were maybe looking forward to becoming a woman and getting our period and what's it gonna be like. And that positive experience, if it ever was, can be recreated in the menopause thing too, you know, like, where am I going? wow what's it going to be like and it's not called the change of life for nothing because everything changes and we've never lived on the hormone cocktail that we live on postmenopausal. so we don't even know who we're going to be and we are going to be a different person and not in a bad way but in the evolution of ourselves like the second spring idea you know who we are who we evolve to be awesome Thank you, uh, Vicky. So we'll pivot to the Q and A. A lot of great questions in the chat. If you have any question, throw it uh, put it in the chat. Um, we might not get to everyone, and uh, we're here for another thirty minutes. So, uh, Rachel, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, this has been wonderful. Um, so yeah, my question was actually because I really. I had some really great um, self-described crone mentors when I was younger. And like what's been striking me is like, there's like quinceañeras for like coming of age with menarche and stuff in some cultures, things like that. But I don't know of any menopausal wise womanhood rites of passage offhand. So I was curious about what those might be, what they could look like. Well, the rite of passage that I had in my community when I had my last period or, you know, when, when, it went, when I realized it wasn't going to keep happening again was like a honoring circle. So basically with all rites of passage, as Adriana said, there needs to be a phase where you are welcomed by your community in your new role and recognized. So <clears throat> a rite of passage can be a ceremony where the community gathers and I'm speaking specifically around menopause now, gathers to honor the woman and to say things like what they've learned from her and what they wish for her, and then to receive her and her words and what she has to offer them. And in my ceremony, they crowned, there were three of us going through it. They crowned us and we sat with capes on and we were danced around and sung to, and then we all feasted together. So we were, we were welcomed by our community in our new role as an elder. So however you do that is a good way, but it needs to be a time when you are, when it's it's spoken what's going on and then the honoring and then the welcoming in, in the new role. Any uh, follow-up question or share, Rachel? Um, yeah, no, just thank you. That was um, like, I, you know, it's just something that, it struck me how much we're missing that kind of thing. That thank you part of it is really cool. That's it. Um, Young, you had a question. Um, yeah, so it's you, Adriana, and good to see you, first time, Jane. Um, so my question originally it was uh, like, could men have our own cycles as well, uh, or should we just like sort of focus on having? Uh, working on better, healthier linearity. And um, maybe I can add to that just, I, I suppose the, the question that I wanted to ask 
or the, the question underneath it is just like, how could men better relate to menstrual cycles? And I could maybe also reference, um, as I initially put in the chat that uh, last week um, in the middle school that I'm in right now, uh, here's my uh, office slash therapy room, um, working as a psychology teacher here. And uh, last week I, you know, was teaching a class and talking about menstrual cycles, which was not easy, um, you know, also as a male teacher. And I was explicitly referencing Ajayana's article and putting that in sort of my Chinese translation on it as well. And um, yeah, I, thankfully, I, I don't think they took it bad. But yeah, one thing that did disappoint me a little bit was like, there are some boys who are listening to it, which is like, <laughs> dude, <laughs> just not paying attention. And um, some would still sort of joke about it. Um, you know, yeah, I don't know, like, um, so, so, so this is sort of the, 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 the question underneath, like how could men better relate to the cycles? Um, can I just say one thing? So Yang, I, I was so uh, touched when you shared with me that you used the article to teach at your school. So yeah, thank you for that, it was beautiful. And um, one thing that I have done with kids, and of course I'd love to hear Jane on that, before and boys is that the cycles um because the cycles are present in everything as jane said you know and um even in you know the getting kids to jump and not stop and then get another child to jump and stop and jump and stop and just notice what happens with a kid that doesn't know they're ever going to stop it's very kinesthetic they, they'll feel because that's um in, in an embodied way how we've been living it's as if there's no cycle, as if there's no rest. So it's like, what, what happens if you know you're never gonna rest? And from a male's perspective, and, I'm, and I'm, of course, uh, if um, a man is, is honoring and noticing the cycle of his partner or people he's around, he'll notice his own cycle. It's a, it's a probing into his own waning and waxing when he needs to rest and pull out because we all have these moments i mean the the cells of the body has it the organs have it but um the woman's even though the woman's is is a coin that's the most unpredictable actually ironically she's most predictable because the cycles are you know spring summer autumn winter and if she starts mapping it she'll start feeling how the pattern feels whereas the man has subtle experiences that and some people are using the moon or noticing how they feel in relationship to the moon or in relationship to to different aspects of their lives but this noticing of when it's when it's the go 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 and when does that stop when does that exhaling need to happen and when need to you to rest and die to that moment and then something else is gonna sprout and rebirth so just this honoring um sh shifts everything in my in my view and maybe jane if you want to sure well thank you for that great question and good on you for teaching the menstrual cycle to those children that's so fantastic and so the story goes that everybody who doesn't have a menstrual cycle for whatever reason that they don't have a womb that they are pregnant breastfeeding on on oral or hormonal contraception or a man or postmenopausal, then their cycle is the lunar cycle, the moon. So the moon, the phases of the moon affect everything on the earth. Like, you know, the moon makes the tides. It's not a minor thing. And the moon is responsible for so many, well, it teaches us the cycle, the waxing and the waning. And 700 plus species on the planet 700 species their reproductive systems are organized around the moon and the story also goes that before before um, electricity which is not that long ago late 1800s before there was so much light pollution in the sky the blueprint is for the menstrual cycle to mirror the lunar cycle so the idea is that it, it, the story goes that all women prior to electricity ovulated with the full moon and bled with the dark moon. And this is not just a fanciful thing. It's based on some um, clear scientific physiological facts that we have a switch in our brains that responds to the light in the night sky 
therefore creates our productions of melatonin, which is linked to our production of estrogen and progesterone, and that when the light, most light is in the night sky, then that's the full moon and that was trigger the ovulation. So that's changed now because, you know, we don't live like that anymore. And it can happen for some women and does for, for many. But the idea around what's a man cycle, the lunar cycle, and that gives us the opportunity to, to feel the, the cycle, which is basically, there's one cycle and everything goes through it. It goes birth, growth, full bloom, harvest, decay, death, rebirth, growth, full bloom, harvest, decay, death, over and over and over. Same cycle in everything, just different speeds. It happens in a day over 24 hours. It happens with the lunar cycle over 29 and a half days with a life cycle and menstrual cycle. So cycles are the way we live. And as I said earlier, if we don't honor the cycle, we end up, well, we haven't honored the cycle and we've ended up in this situation that we are in the globe global situation. But the other thing about how can men better relate to the menstrual cycle is to be present to it, you know, like not ignore it, work with your partner, your wife, your daughter, your sister, whoever you live with, because it'll be affecting you whether you want it to or not through the pheromones, which are hormones who travel through the air and affect everybody, you know. So what we need to do is normalize the menstrual cycle, like bring it out of the hid, hiding cupboard and normalize it because we live in a negative menstrual cycle culture. So one of the tasks of us today in the world is to co-create a positive menstrual cycle culture. And one of the easiest ways to do this is for mothers of children, little children to, to normalize the menstrual cycle. You know, like mothers don't go to the toilet on their own anyway. So they'd have to be practicing some pretty fancy gymnastics to hide what they're doing if they're changing pads or tampons or whatever. So the best thing to do is to talk about it. Oh, mummy's bleeding now. And so oh, that means we're gonna have a rest today, another extra cup of tea or whatever. Somehow frame how we need to behave and, and be with our bodies through the, through the cycle. And little boys who grow up like that, they know that it's a thing. And then they, they, they're more present to it as, as what's going on. And then they make, much more sympathetic and compassionate brothers and boyfriends and husbands and bosses because they their mother didn't hide it so that's that's one of the places where we can be creating the future of a positive menstrual culture cycle culture by by normalizing it and i just wanted to add one thing just hearing you say jane about um men holding or being with you know like um because there's so much tension in this relationship with how we are once we start coming in connection with what happens in the cycle for women and what we feel like doing and how the world expects us to be there is a tension that tension goes somewhere and uh, you know in the beginning of recognizing this it might be pms it might be this anger or grief or frustration so for a man to actually hold that or for anybody to hold that, it takes capacity. So it's not, it's, um, again, I'm not making it really easy. It's not, it's not an easy thing what we're, what we're talking about. It's, it's growing the capacity to be with discomfort. It's actually going, growing the capacity to be with another in pain because this amount of time that we have suppressed ourselves and have pretended or played life as if we were like this instead of being like this, if you just do that with your arm and see how the tension that happens if you try to pretend you're not a, a circle. So that tension is present in and it can show up in the woman's uh, emotional landscape and to for a man or for a friend, for people to be with that healing because there will be um, the need for others to hold that, you know, to hold each other in, in love and compassion for, for this grief, for this energy to be processed as as culture any uh share follow-up share yeah um, no just trying to hold everything yeah lovely thank you um merit you had a question you can unmute yourself 
if you're here. We're getting a hey in the chat. Um, so she's in the library. Okay, so uh, we'll pivot to another question for now. Um, Mary asked me to read this on her behalf. Um, let me scroll up. Okay, what elements would be important to include in the first Menarch rite of passage? And actually, I had a question similar to this. Uh, maybe I'll we'll take on to it. Any examples that you have in cultures or subcultures that uh, uh, maybe are innovative or new approaches to rite of passage uh, passages for the Menarch? Well, basically, just as a clue. A newborn baby is hardwired to expect that when it's born, its mother is going to look after it. So too is a girl hardwired to expect that when she goes through her menarche or in preparation for her menarche, her first period, she is hardwired to expect that her mother or her aunties or her grandmas or whoever is going to teach her about her menstrual cycle, teach her about her body and what the changes are all about and how the menstrual cycle works and how to work with the menstrual cycle, how to be with it and what the magic of it is and what the, what the opportunity of it is. So, so that needs to be met, that need. And it's way beyond the science lesson in sex education at schools because the menstrual cycle is so often taught in schools to be simply about avoiding conception, where there's so much more to the menstrual cycle than conception or contraception. So education needs to be a really important factor or part of a menarch ceremony. And that's not the ceremony, right? That needs to happen before and then be maintained afterwards. So there's basically several aspects to a uh, rite of passage, and that is the um, recognition of the person being at the place and then taking them away from their community and then bringing them back. So in the same way that I described what was happening for that menopause ritual for me, for a menarch ritual or ceremony, it's a community event. And a lot of girls will not want to do that because, you know, they still go to school or have friends who who are very deep in menstrual shame. And it's this horrifying concept to be, um, call, you know, called out as having blood, you know, like that is like in many in many families and in many schools and friendship circles, the most embarrassing thing that could ever happen. So basically you need to um, create the menarch ceremony that the girl will want because you don't want to turn it into a trauma for her where she remembers for the rest of her life how embarrassing it was. So there needs to be a reframe before it even happens so that it's a, not just a, a good thing to do to honour the menarch, it's a normal thing to do, it's a necessary thing to do. Because when we understand how rites of passage work, we know that what happens is going to teach her how woman is valued in her culture and how she's supposed to behave to be accepted as a woman. So in the community that I have been part of for decades where I live, what we used to do to honour the menarch, so this is in the community, so the families would do their own little thing in whatever way that might have been, like a, a dinner, family dinner, honouring this rite of passage and perhaps presents and whatever, like a birthday kind of a thing. But what we did in the community was that we had a women's circle and the girls, well, we would do this once a year and we would do it at the peak of spring, which is an, um, a time in the year when we honour the potential of the feminine and the masculine and it's a fertility festival in the ancient traditions. But so our community would gather at that time and there would be the women's circle and the girls who had started their periods that year or those who hadn't been honoured already at another time would come together in their little group or maybe it was one or two of them and the ceremony would include them having some time away from the women's circle with their mothers or mother equivalent and they would dress in a in a particular dress that they chose for the ceremony and often it was red and their mothers would make them a flower crown so 
a bit like like uh, the debutante kind of focus. So it's introducing the taking the girl out of her girlness and bringing her back in her changed role as a as a woman. And so they would dress for it, and then they would come to the circle where the rest of the women would be. And then one by one, these girls would go around and face each woman. And the process that happened each time they faced the women, each woman in the circle, they would the woman they would hold hands, and the woman would say to the girl who was having the ceremony, "I saw you coming from afar, and you were beautiful." I saw you coming from afar, and you were beautiful. I saw you coming from afar, and you are beautiful. So then she would go to the next one, and they'd say the same thing over and over and over. So it was the opportunity for this girl to be receiving this appreciation of her, and then one by one, the girls would sit in the center of the circle, and. The women on the outer circle, which included her mother, would make a wish for her, and so they would, you know, wish them wellness and happiness, like whatever it was. And these women knew these girls, so they could be particular in their wishes, that were making it very relevant. And then I meant to say, prior to that sharing of wishes, there was an educational process where. Each of the women in the circle spoke the answers to three questions, which were, "What I was, what I was told before my menstrual cycle started, and that was often nothing. What I've learned from my menstrual cycle over the years, and every woman had a lot to say about that. And the final question, what I, what I wish I had been told before my menstrual cycle started. And so often it was like I wish." I was having a ceremony like you're having, and I was honoured and things like that. So then the、um, each girl honoured, and then at the end, the girls would have their time in the middle by themselves and and would reply. And that was often the very scariest part. They would get too nervous, and I would just say, just say thank you. And then some of the girls would say many more things like, I feel like I've been welcomed to a special club. And you know, it's just like really honouring them and and wonderful. And then we would have a feast of red food. So that's a modern version of something that ha- that does feature in all traditional cultures prior to the patriarchy. You know, in the First Nations、um, tribes of, of the of the Americas, there are lots of documented tribal gatherings where the the many of the tribes would come together once a year. And honor the girls, and they would spend time with their grandmothers and whatnot. And there's other ones where they have to do certain things. So it's not a it's not a new thing. It's a new old thing. And and then as Adriana said before, the key thing is that those girls are going to go back to school and back into a situation where hardly anybody does that. So part of the ongoing holding of these Women, these becoming women, is to hold them in a community that does honour it and doesn't make a joke of it or a, or turn them into a fool for even wanting to have that. So, the culture needs to support these women. Otherwise, those girls end up feeling like parents have betrayed them by saying this is something good when everybody else says it's still something bad. So, much has to happen to support this on every level. Very cool.、Um, so we might have time for one more question.、Uh, Mary Andrea,、uh, if you're in the room, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Wow, it's just hearing all of、uh, those rituals. Really, there's such distance to what we have right now. So I'm a little like feeling. Some wound around that, but、um, and I really appreciate the conversation and just the quality of the space. I'm pregnant, so anything, everything around birth feels like super relevant. So basically, I was just wanting some more wisdom around how to have a more natural relationship to. 
birth to the process, like a healed. Just it's just like a general one more of that kind of question. So yeah, thank you. Probably one of the fastest, most revealing things you could do in preparation for birth is to acknowledge the fears you hold. So instead of ignoring your fears, acknowledge them, bring them right up out of the dark, even the most scary ones, because acknowledging our fears gives us the opportunity to understand what they're signposts for. So in order to have a particular fear, you have to believe something that enables the fear. So the process is acknowledge your fears, figure out what the belief is you have to have to have that fear, and then ask yourself, do you even believe that? Because half the time you won't even believe the belief you have to have to have the fear, because we just inherit all these fears. And then if you don't believe the belief, you can scrap the fear. And then you just have to keep reminding yourself if that shows up again, oh, I don't even believe what you have to believe to have that fear, so go away. If you do believe the belief, then you've got the opportunity to ask yourself, do I want to believe that? Like, do I want to believe that birth is dangerous? And possibly you don't want to believe that birth is dangerous. So what you've got the opportunity to do is to upgrade your belief system and replace that belief that you don't even want to have, which you probably inherited from the culture, with a belief that more represents what you actually believe. So then you upgrade your belief system so you don't have to have that belief. I mean, that fear, sorry. And then if you, if you figure out the belief you have to have to have the fear and you do believe it, and you want to keep believing it, then that's a signpost for you. That's a red flag for you. That's a fear to pay attention to. So that's a quick and easy thing to do. And I would say do that with your partner too, because that matters as well. And also to figure out one of the other things you can do is figure out the trajectory that you're on from your previous rites of passage. So maybe your menarch, your first period taught you some dodgy things about what it means to be a woman. So you need to upgrade that message to your inner maiden because your inner maiden never goes away your inner maiden like all of our inner maidens are probably in the driver's seat most of the time and most probably in her most wounded form most of the time so we know we can rewire our brains now so what the process to do is to figure out what your menarch taught you about being a woman and what pattern that created and has played out all your life and then give your maiden a new message. So you could use the negative message you probably got and reframe that in a positive way and keep reminding yourself of that. And more than anything in preparation for birth, read positive birth stories. You know, birth works. Look at the population on the planet. Like it doesn't not work. And 80% of the births on the planet happen in third world countries with no medical help, you know? It's, it's just our modern culture that has had us believe that we need experts and drugs and whatnot. So you can do this. You've been designed to do it. And you'll have the birth you need to have to teach you whatever you need to learn. So just trust the process. Trust your life un, un, unfolding and, and be with what is and listen to your body. I, um, <clears throat> I'd like to add something, <clears throat> Maria Andrea. I... So that's how I met Jane. I was pregnant with my first daughter and I came in with all the fears possible. I actually didn't, I never wanted to get pregnant. Tremendous was my fear. Um, my culture has a crazy amount of cesarean sections, like, uh, and um, I think it was 80% or 85 at the time of my pregnancy. I didn't know anybody in my lineage that had given birth naturally. Like there was no, just, I didn't have that reference as a normal thing. It wasn't a normal thing. So, so I, so all the things that Jane was saying is true. And when I entered her circle and when I saw all these women um, treating birth as natural, that for me was a new thing. I was just like, wow, I'm not an activist because from my parents, <laughs> my family lineage perspective, I was an activist. I was trying to prove something, go back to the old days. Um, Having said that, not my mom's perspective, but you know, my aunt very close to me is a gynecologist obstetrician. So I had that in myself. So what I did have to do, and I noticed, I noticed that I didn't have the capacity in me 
to uh, work through these fears if I was met with a lot of resistance. So I just actually, I would stop people's conversations. I would literally leave circles that would, would make my physiology in fight and flight. I would just, I didn't have in me uh, a way to work through that. So the first pregnancy, I was very diligent. I was just like, this is the only thing I'm gonna read. This is the only thing I'm gonna consume. I'm gonna hang out with Jane's, Jane's midwives groups and so I needed to actually to in to uh, I took nine months to actually bring new thought and new way of seeing something so I was quite masculine if you say in one way I was very very um, diligent in the second pregnancy and it was beautiful and it was um, I met a lot of things and one of the things in transition which is the time that you go oh, I can't do this. I'm not going to be able to do this. I remember the thought of just all the women had, that had done bef that before me. And I remember crying, you know, it's, it's a very beautiful, it's a very beautiful thing. The second birth, I had that trust in my body. So the second birth, I, I could hear stories. I could hear people talking about anything and it just didn't, it didn't move me in the same way. So, um, you know, there is just honor your, what you what you really need and um, surround yourself with people you love and trust and that's that's very important thank you thank you all right so we're approaching the the bottom of the hour um, and perhaps uh adriana and uh, jane any parting words you'd like to leave us with here at the store or anyone watching um, and perhaps maybe where uh, we can find uh, all the good work that you're doing Um, Jane, you, you go, you go. I was just <laughs> going to say reclaiming the menstrual cycle is a revolutionary act. You know, it will change everything. It will mean that we really do welcome women as they are instead of them trying to be like men. You know, equality has looked like women are equal to men so long as they can do what they do. Women are so different to men, and we've been pretending that we're not to our peril, to everybody's peril. And another really important thing I'd like to just say is, you know, we're talking about where we are and what's going on, but what, a lot of the answers to where we are come from the information about how we got into this situation in the first place. And there's lots to be read about that. I've written something called the Her Story, as opposed to his story or history, get it? His story, history. I've written the her story, and it talks about the effect of the patriarchy on the feminine, not just women on the feminine. The only cultures that have survived the patriarchy are the cultures that have not only oppressed the feminine, but also sacrificed their men. So there's a big piece of this whole situation is about um, how we got into this situation in the first place. And you can find what I've written and lots of things that I say, etc., on my website, janehardwickcollings.com, and the school of shamanic womancraft.com is the women's mystery school that I started. And I'm quite um, busy on social media sharing all sorts of revolutionary acts. So it's been a wonderful opportunity to be here and thank you peter for organizing all of this and thank you adriana for inviting me and good on you everybody for staying with this really controversial ridiculously controversial subject um this has been beautiful and moving and exciting to me to be in this space in the merging of the worlds in which a space where new ideas and thoughts and people with openness and creativity to, to do new beautiful things in the world are now talking about um, the menstrual cycle. So that feels really exciting to me. To me, this is the beginning of um, my work in this way because um, my work includes development and systems thinking and integral theory and the women's mysteries. I don't wanna separate it anymore. So. Um, it's it's here, it's together, it's all of us um, in order to have game B and meta modernity and all the beautiful things that we want to have. We need to bring this into the conversation so that, you know, the way we speak and I often in um, 
in circles that some of you have been a part of, you know, I've often cried and explained why I was crying. So people didn't judge my, my, um, my cry for something else. Or I explained where I was in my cycle and then reframed what that meant. I was doing that to the shock of some people, but what I was doing was like, I'm not linear and I can't show up in the way that um, the society expects me to. And, and this is one of the ways that I think we can start these conversations from, um, from a different place to make it more visible. So um, I have a website called fullyhuman.com.au. It doesn't have much of this work because it's very new. I have some articles, a few articles of the medium. And I am starting soon a project with a male friend and collaborator called Nick Jenkel. And we're going to do the stance of the masculine and feminine from many angles, including systems and all the good stuff. So I, if you're interested, you can find me, email me. I'm always interested in having conversations about it and bringing the word out. So thank you so much for Peter and Jane and everybody that's here. It's been, it's been very beautiful. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Jane and Adriana. Uh, I'll include those links on the, um, the YouTube video for those who are watching. And uh, thank you, Adriana, for bringing the session about and I, like just more of this, more uh, mixing, cross-pollinating different kind of fields and energies and thoughts is, is much needed. And uh, so much gratitude for this session. And um, for those of you who are first timers at the STOA, you can check out more events at the STOA.ca. A related event that we're having uh, as a Patreon event on June 24th is the Knife's Edge of Trauma, the Potential Growth Factor of Human Consciousness. Um, that being said, uh, everyone, thank you so much for coming to the store today.